Good evening and Hajj Samaya to you who live here and to those who came to celebrate Pesach with us in Jerusalem. Welcome and Mwadil Simcha. We live in an area where terrorism does not come to a halt. Terrorism is continuing and continuing and there is no end in sight. The Sunnites are fighting the Shiites. The Shiites are fighting the Alawites. The Alawites are fighting the Yazidis. The Yazidis are fighting the Sunnites. Al-Qaeda is fighting the Islamic State. And it could have been just, you know, to sit down on the sideline for us and sit back and see them fighting each other if you wouldn't live among them. We have homemade terrorism. Hezbollah is already planning its next war against Israel. It's only been six months since the past war in Gaza in the summer, and Hamas is rebuilding their tunnels. The reason for all of this insanity, the reason for all of this terrorism, is that the Palestinian terror organization think that they finally found the key that will destroy the Jewish state and will drive us from our land. And our neighbors around us are pouring millions and millions of dollars into the hands of the Palestinian terror organizations in order to keep the pot boiling and to make sure that more and more Jewish life will be lost. When the Intifada broke out in the year of 2000, we were young lawyers who decided that we must take a role in the war against terrorism. We saw that the blood was spilled on the streets, that suicide bombers are bombing our malls, our cafes, our buses, and we needed to do something. So we decided to do what lawyers do best, go after the pocketbook of the terror organizations because we realize that money is the oxygen for the terrorism. If you cut the money, you can cut the terrorism. No terror organization can go without money. Today we're representing hundreds of terror victims in lawsuits and legal actions against the terror organizations and their financial patrons against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, PLO, Hezbollah, Palestine Authority, against Iran, Syria, North Korea. Can't hear me? Can you? All right. Against, it's better? Against banks. against banks that provide financial services to terror organizations, like Arab Bank, Bank of China, UBS, American Express Bank, Lebanese Canadian Bank. And I'm here to speak to you about a portion of these cases, to tell you how we started, where we stand today. The biggest bank in the Arab world called the Arab Bank. Not a very creative name, but that's its name. It's based in Jordan, it has branches all over the world, and it's got over $30 billion in assets. It's like the city bank of the Arab world. During the Intifada, the Arab Bank ran a reward program in favor of the families of the suicide bombers, which went like this. If you were a father or a mother of a suicide bomber, if you were a child of a suicide bomber, you could have gone to the Hamas headquarters in Gaza, get a letter from them saying that you are a father, a mother, or a child of a suicide bomber. Take the letter to the branch of the Arab Bank in Gaza, show it to the bank manager, and the bank manager will give you a reward of many thousands of dollars. Ads were published all over the Arab world. If you want to support your brothers in the Palestinian Authority, if you want to help the Shaheed, the martyrs, donate money to a specific bank account in Gaza. People in Saudi Arabia knew that if they donate money to a specific bank account in Gaza, they can go back home, sit in their living rooms, 
Dr. Jazeera TV showing the ambulances taking away the bodies of the dead and the injured in Jerusalem. The Arab death could have continued with this reward program for many years unless they made a little mistake. They ran this program on having a branch in New York. It was a lead attorney, Gary Olson, who realized that you can actually get a jurisdiction <coughs> over the bank in New York. We joined him and we filed a lawsuit against the Arab Bank on behalf of 50 families of terror victims that were killed or injured by Hamas, seeking over $5 billion compensation. The first thing the Arab Bank did was trying to close its branch in New York. The Congress didn't let them to do so. After a long negotiation, they had to freeze $450 million of their money in the United States, and then they didn't have a choice but to litigate the case. They hired one of the biggest law firms in the United States to represent them in court, and filed a motion to dismiss the case. But all their motions were denied. The court ordered them to turn over into our hands all the documentation of the transaction that they did from the beginning of the Intifada. And there was a paper trail that proved that the Arab Bank gave money to the families of the suicide bombers knowingly and intentionally. We all thought that the bank will compromise. Instead, they decided to go to trial. It was a jury trial. It opened in August last year, 2014, less than 50 days. The jury went to the liberation and came back after three days finding the bank guilty in all the terror attacks of the lawsuits. <laughs> the bank lost the case. In July, we're going to hear damages. And the damages are horrible. Let me tell you about one of them. Hannah Nachenberg and her family. That we represent, and her aunt and uncles are sitting with us in the crowd. Hannah Nachenberg is a young woman from New York who lives in Israel, and in August 2001 decided to take her family to eat pizza in the Sbarro Pizza Place in Jerusalem. Shortly after she entered the restaurant, a suicide bomber from the Hamas wearing explosive vests entered the restaurant and blew himself up. Everybody remember the suicide bombing. Everybody remember the famous sign of the Sparrow Pizza Place lies down on the floor and around it on the dead and the injured. Everybody remember where it happened. It happened right there. In the intersection between King George Street, this street, and Jaffa, the heart of the commercial district of Jerusalem. The same server responsible for this attack was the one who blew up the moment cafe near the Prime Minister's office a while before, killing 18 young people and the one that would blow up Hebrew University cafeteria a while later, ending up with the death of seven young students. Hannah Nachenberg did not get killed in that attack. A metal pin entered her head and lighted her brain. She went into irreversible coma. She was hospitalized at the Dasa Hospital in Jerusalem, and after many months, when the doctor saw there was no improvement in her situation, she was moved to a medical center in Israel, and she's staying there until this day. Every day, her parents come to the hospital, sit near her bed, and pray. I've seen photos of Hannah's daughter, five years old Sarah, dressed up in Purim custom, coming to show her mother how she dressed up in Purim that year. I've seen photos of Hannah's brother dressed up in his tuxedo wedding suit, coming to show his sister how he dressed up in his wedding day. Every single day, her parents come to the hospital, enter her room, sit near her bed, and pray. On behalf of Hannah Nachenberg and the rest of the families of the terror victims, we'll take these cases until the end. Case is not over but the Arab Bank already changed the way they were doing businesses. Not only the Arab Bank. This lawsuit sent a shockwave through the international banking system that no bank agreed anymore to open bank account to a designated organization. 
Novik agreed to open bank account to an Islamic charity that raised funds or identified with the terror organization, and no bank agreed to operate in terror zones like South Lebanon, like Gaza. There is no banking system in Gaza. This is why we see them smuggling money into Gaza with suitcases through the tunnels. And that caused Hamas a great deal of harm because they need to bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Gaza Strip. Their budget stands today on half a billion dollars. They need this money because they run an alternative government in Gaza. They need this money, first and foremost, to support the population. The reason the population in Gaza let Hamas shoot missiles towards Israel in the war in the summer, from their backyards, from their living rooms, from their hospitals, kindergartens, schools, the reason the population in Gaza lets Hamas use them in human shields, logo on the top of the roofs and warn the IDF not to shoot missiles towards the buildings, is because Hamas provides the population in Gaza with all services they need from cradle, from cradle to grave for free. They give them medical education, social services, education. Hamas runs a military. They have tens of thousands of people. Soldiers, sometimes you wear uniforms, sometimes not, but they always get paid on a monthly basis. Hamas has thousands of prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail who get salary and their families get confiscated. They get money, thousands of dollars each month, depends on the sentence that the prisoner received, which derives from the number of Israelis he killed. And Hamas built these sophisticated tunnels. They used to come from Egypt into Gaza to smuggle in munition terrorist money. Today they are going from Gaza into Israel to send suicide bombers to kill us. To maintain all this infrastructure, Hamas needed hundreds of millions of dollars. So they ran into a problem because they needed a bank. They could no longer do it through the tunnels. They could not bring hundreds of millions of dollars into the Gaza Strip. So after a lot of efforts, they found a bank. They found a bank that did not care about anti-money laundering laws, a bank that did not care about anti-terrorism law, a bank that thought that he is above the law, it's one of the biggest banks in the world, it's called the Bank of China. The Bank of China agreed to open bank account to a Hamas terrorist who fled away from Gaza named Shurafa set in Urnju, and received money from the headquarters of Hamas in Syria, hundred thousand of dollars each month. The money was going to the Bank of China in New York, landing in his account in Kornju. Shurafa was pulling the money out and sending it to his brother and father, other Hamas terrorists in Gaza. The counter-terrorism division of the Israeli government went to China, met with the Central Bank of China, and urged them to close down the account. But the Chinese said that Hamas is not a designated terror organization in China, there is no violation of the Chinese law, and therefore they have no intention to close down the account. So we were asked if we can take the Chinese to court. And we agreed because this is what we like to do. We gathered families of terror victims that were killed or injured by the rockets attacks from Gaza into Sderot and other southern communities in the country. We gathered the families of the children that were massacred in Merkaz Arab Shiva in Jerusalem. We gathered families that lost their loved ones in suicide bombings in Elat in Tel Aviv. We took all these tens of victims and filed a major lawsuit against Bank of China in New York. This lawsuit drove the Chinese crazy. It was right before the Olympic Games. They sent us warning letters telling us to stop talking about the lawsuit. 
They warned us that by connecting their name to terror financing, we're destroying their reputation, we are ruining their name. They threatened us with a libel suit against us in China and with a criminal prosecution against us in China. This is why none of us are going to China any day soon. <laughs> and then they filed motion for Rule 11 to impose penalty on the lawyers for filing a frivolous lawsuit. They claim we have no evidence to support the case. And finally, they filed a motion to dismiss the case. They had three allegations. One, the case should be moved to China. There is no connection to New York. The terror victims are from Israel. Damages happen in Israel. The terror attacks happen in Israel. The bank is a Chinese bank. What's the connection to New York? Their second allegation was that the court should apply the Chinese law. And the third allegation was that we have no evidence to support the case. We hired experts that explained to the court what happens to lawyers who dare to bring a lawsuit against a government-owned bank in, the chi in China. We proved that the law that should apply should be the Israeli law, not even the New York law. And we had a former intelligence officer that filed an affidavit in court explaining about the different wire transactions, why the money belonged to Hamas, why it was going to Hamas, and testify about the intention of the bank to keep funding Hamas despite that he knew the money belongs to Hamas. With all this ammunition, we were winning the motion to dismiss. The court ruled that the case would remain in New York. He applied the Israeli law and decided there were enough evidence to go to the position and discovery. At this point, we had to testify another agent, intelligence officer, that met the Chinese to explain the court about the intentional behavior of the bank. But Israel backed off. There was a tremendous pressure put on Prime Minister Netanyahu from the Chinese government, urging him to obstruct the case and to not let the witness testify. Israel did not provide us with the evidence we need. We did not sit back and we found ourselves ironically litigating against the state of Israel. But we cannot back off. We must fight back. We must fight until the end because our clients, the terror victims, fought until the bitter end. Ella Bukasis was only 17 years old when she was walking one Shabbat with her brothers, 15 years old, in Sderot, going to Bnei Akiva Youth Movement, when the red alert went off. This is the alarm that goes on when the missiles are falling from Gaza. In Tel Aviv, you have 90 seconds to find a shelter. In Jerusalem, you also have 90 seconds. In Ashdod, you have only 60 seconds to find a shelter. And in the road, you have 15 seconds to find a shelter. So she was walking down the street. It was a bare street. There was no bus stop, no building to hide underneath them. The only thing that went into her mind was to protect her brother. She fell over her brother, she covered him. The missile fell right near their heads. Many strap nails went into their both heads. She fought for seven days on her life in the hospital. She died. Her brother is disabled for life. We will not let them kill our children and keep silent. We will fight them back. Another sort of case we're litigating is cases against state-sponsored terrorism. Every time Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah carries out attacks against Israel, we file a lawsuit in the Federal District Court of Washington against Iran, Syria, and North Korea. North Korea is involved in the Middle East conflicts 
since the beginning. They helped Iran to build their nuclear bunker, they helped Syria to build their nuclear facilities, and they helped Hezbollah to build the underground tunnels where Hezbollah utilized in order to ship missiles towards Israel in the Second Lebanese War. We have victims, American victims, that filed a lawsuit against North Korea, victims from the Second Lebanese War, and we got a judgment. The court found North Korea liable for the missile attacks that Hezbollah shoot towards Israel, and now we're going to damages. Against Iran and against Syria, we already have judgments, monetary ones, for hundreds of millions of dollars. Usually Iran and Syria don't come to court. We get a default judgment against them, proving our case. And then comes the big question, how do you collect? So in the beginning we found frozen bank accounts that belong to the Iranian government sitting in the United States. We wanted to execute these bank accounts against our judgment. But the State Department opposed us. The State Department wanted to have us say what to do with the money. They did not want it to go to the terror victims. They wanted to keep it for the days that they have new relations with Iran. So we hired a lobbyist. We hired a former Undersecretary of State, Stuart Eisenstein, that helped us to pass a law in the Congress, which overcame the objection of the State Department. And we were able to seize the money in the account and give it to the terror victims. We also found the house that belonged to the Persian Shah. Years ago, the son of the Shah wanted to become a pilot. So his father sent him to Lubeck, Texas, where they have a big Air Force base, and bought him a house. After the Islamic Revolution, the house became a property of the Iranian government, who confiscated the house and nationalized it. We heard about the house. We went to the sheriff in Lubeck, Texas gave him our judgment and asked him to force the sale on the house. The sheriff sold the house and gave us the money towards the terror victims. <laughs> Today we have liens on a building in Queens, New York, that is owned by an Iranian bank, owned by the Iranian government, and on a huge building in 655th Avenue in Manhattan that also own half by an Iranian bank waiting to be sold. If we're talking about the Iranian revolution, let me tell you a very interesting story. After the Islamic revolution in Iran, a lot of people tried to escape from Iran. Many Jews tried to cross the border from Iran to Afghanistan. From Afghanistan walked for four days to Turkey. And in Turkey, take a plane to Israel, United States, or any other country in Europe. In 1994 and 1997, 12 Iranian Jews that tried to cross the border from Iran to Afghanistan disappeared somewhere along the border. Nobody knew what happened to them. Their families went to the Iranian government to seek for information, but the Iranian government refused to give them any information. The families went and held their own investigation. They went to every hospital in Iran, they visited every jail in Iran, they went to every police station in Iran, asking if anybody knows what's happened to their children, to their husbands, to their fathers, but nobody gave them any information. After some years, the families left Iran, some of them moved to Israel, one family moved to LA. A neighbor of the family that moved to LA came to them and told them that back then in Iran, he was dealing with a major prison over there, every prison in Tehran, trying to sell them a land. In the course of the business deal, he was invited to the jail to take a tour to learn what the needs of the prison are. He came to the jail, he took the tour, he was accompanied with one of the guards who took him along, and towards the end of the tour, they went downstairs 10 floors below ground. When they reached the 10th floor, the neighbor saw a very dark cell. He approached the cell, 
and he suddenly recognized that some of his neighbors had disappeared some years before. The boy was very excited. He thought that finally somebody came to rescue him. He approached the gate, but the neighbor was very afraid, didn't say a word, and took a step back. In the end of the tour, they went upstairs, 10 floors up, and the neighbor who couldn't hold himself very carefully asked the guard who were the prisoners that he saw in the dark cell. And the guard told him that they were Jewish prisoners who tried to escape from Iran. So now we know that these 12 missing Iranian Jews might be alive, probably have been tortured, and we needed to do something about the case. First, we filed high court petitions here in Israel, in the Supreme Court, urging the Israeli Mossad to go and inquire with the Iranian government what happened to these 12 missing Iranian Jews. After a long year, the Mossad came back to court and said that unfortunately, he was not able to find any information about them. So then we thought to find a case in the United States to raise public awareness. Our choice to do that was to file a case against an Iranian official, but it's one condition, that we catch him in the United States and we serve him with a lawsuit. So one day we hear that the former president of Iran, Muhammad Khatami, is coming to the United States to be a speaker in the UN. We thought that would be a great opportunity to sue him. So we look at his itinerary, and we saw that the next night is going to be a speaker in a dinner that was held for him by CARE, Council of American Islamic Relations. We learned that for $400, you can buy a ticket for the dinner, and for additional $400, you can buy a photo opportunity with Khatami. <laughs> so we hired a process server from Virginia, an ex-policeman, we gave him our papers plus $800. $400 for the dinner, $400 for the photo opportunity. He came to the dinner along with his wife. His turn to take the photo with Khatami arrived. He stood near Khatami, handed him the papers, told him that the families of 12 missing Iranian Jews are suing him in court. Khatami took the papers and the photographer took the photo. <laughs> photo in the back page of the booklet that you are holding. Take a look. Uh, yes. On Shraddin booklets, yes. <coughs> the uh, professor and his wife did not stay for dinner. Khatami had 20 days to enter the lawsuit, he failed, and we are waiting for the Virginian court to come down with a decision. When the court will come down with a decision, we know that Khatami has assets in Germany and France that we will try to go after, but this wasn't the reason why we filed the lawsuit. We filed the lawsuit to warn Iranian officials that once they leave to Iran, there will be courts, there will be processing, there will be private lawyers that will try to indict them for their crimes against the Jewish people. When Israel's enemies realize that they cannot beat us militarily, that despite the seven wars they launched against us and the horrific wave of terrorism they unleashed against us, we are still here. They started to use a different type of weapon. Unconventional one, very devastating one. Brand new weapon called BDS and Lawfare. They call academics, companies, individuals from all over the world to boycott Israel to sanction it and to divest from it in order to isolate the Jewish state, 
in order to put pressure on the Jewish state to alienate, to reach their goal. And their goal, if you go on the website, it says very clearly that they have a solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's a one-state solution, Palestinian state. One of their attempts was the Gaza Flotilla. They decided that they are going to breach the sea blockade that Israel had over Gaza in order to confront the IDF soldiers, which will try to block them on the high sea. They will show pictures of IDF soldiers beating up civilians, and it will show Israel in a very cruel way. So they rented the boat, a very big boat, a Turkish boat called the Mavi Mara, gathered 500 Muslim extremists, pro-Palestinians, and set sail towards Israel from Turkey. When they reached the territorial border of Israel, the Israeli Navy asked them to stop. But the Mavi Mamara said that they are not going to stop. They said, you Jews, go back to Auschwitz. And the Navy did not have a choice. They sent helicopters to the air where they let Navy SEALs go down with ropes into the boat. The Navy SEALs were unarmed because they thought there were only civilians on the boat. When they reached the bottom of the boat, they were almost lynched to death by terrorists from the IHH terror organization from Turkey who welcomed them with poles, metal poles, knives, and guns. There was a bloody fight on the boat which ended with the death of nine of the terrorists and a bad injury of ten of the IDF soldiers. That caused a disaster to the state of Israel. Not only in terms of PR, they kept showing again and again these pictures of the IDF soldiers fighting civilians. But in terms of foreign relations, Turkey threatened to break up relationship with Israel and under tremendous pressure of President Obama on Prime Minister Netanyahu, Netanyahu almost paid $20 million to the families of the terrorists that got killed on the boat. And in terms of war crimes, Turkey rushed and filed a war crime complaint against Israel in the International Criminal Court, issued arrest warrants against them, and asked Interpol to make this arrest warrants international. So the next year, these pro-Palestinian Muslim extremists wanted to repeat their success. But this time, not with one boat, but with 15 boats. And not with 500 BDS movement people, but with 1,500. They got all type of celebrities. They got famous authors like Alice Walker. They got the European Parliament members. They got the sister of law, Tony Blair, and they all went in to set sail towards Israel, this time not from Turkey, who learned its lesson, but from Greece. We interrupted in, were brainstorming, thinking what we can do in order to stop the boats from sailing, not even let them reach the territorial water of Israel, not to have them confront another battle with the idea of soldiers on the high sea. And we're thinking what all the boats need in order to sell that we can legally block. And we come with this idea of maritime insurance. All the boats need maritime insurance in order to sell and no port will let any boat to sell without maritime insurance. So we send warning letters to all the maritime insurance companies in the world. There are not so many of them, only 30. And we told them that if you insure the boats, you are adding and abetting a terror organization because the end goal of the boats is to help Hamas in Gaza, which is a designated terror organization. And if you provide any type of services to the Hamas organization, you are risking civil liability and criminal liability in the United States for violating the Anti-Terrorism Act. Lloyds of London who said that indeed Hamas
Hamas is a designated terror organization in Israel, the United States, Europe, and Canada. They have no intention to insure the boats. And if we provide them with the international maritime number of the boats, they will cancel their insurance. You have to remember what the anarchists did, what the pro-Palestinian people did. They went to countries like Indonesia, like Singapore, like Thailand, bought boats, brought them to Delaware. In Delaware, they registered them under new names like Audacity of Hope, like Freedom to Gaza. But the only authentic thing that was left was the international maritime number. We went to the Israeli Navy, the Navy Intelligence, and asked them if they know any numbers of the boat. They knew some, they forwarded them to us, we gave them to the insurance companies, and in a couple of days, six of the boats canceled their participation because lack of insurance. Then we asked the Navy what else we can go after because our knowledge about boats is this boat Staten Island Ferry. <laughs> and the Navy told us you should go after the satellite communication services. We thought what it was, we say, they said it's a GPS, telephone communication, internet services. In the Middle East, they told us, it's all provided by one company. It's called Inmarset. We asked them where they sit, they told us Dubai. When we searched this company, we realized that they had offices in Miami as well. So we sent a warning letter to Inmarset, the exact letter we sent to the insurance companies, but Inmarset ignored us. So we took them to court. We filed a temporary injunction against them in the court in Miami. And after two days, we read in the New York Times that the biggest boat of them all, the Mavi Mamara, is pulling out of the flotilla because lack of insurance and other communication problems. <laughs> then we got a hold of Governor Rick Perry, the governor of Texas. Who here are some Texas people here. Um, governor Perry heard me speak in one of his visits to Israel. At the end of my talk, he came to me and said, I love your work. I love what Shuratadim does. If you ever need my help, please don't hesitate to call. And you know us Israelis, we don't hesitate to call. <laughs> So we asked Governor Perry if we'd be willing to send a letter to the Attorney General of the United States asking him why he's not going after those who raise funds for the flotilla in the United States because this is a violation of the Neutrality Act. The Neutrality Act is a very old law. It was legislated in 1789. It's an anti-piracy law. It designated against those pirates who were attacking the boat of Netherlands, of England, who are going down to the Caribbean through the United States. And it prohibits anyone in the United States to take part in a hostile act against a friendly state in the United States. And specifically prohibits anyone in the United States to take part in a hostile exhibition, a naval expedition against a friendly state to the United States. Israel is an ally of the United States. So Governor Perry sent this letter and it was published all over the media that now the Attorney General might go after those who raise funds for the flotilla in the United States. And lastly, we approached a law firm in Greece. We asked them to go and demand the port authorities in Greece to go and check all the boats who are waiting to set sail towards Israel if they fit to sail, if they have maritime insurance, if they have satellite communication services, and to check their form. We learned that according to the Greek law, every boat that wants to leave Greece has to fill up a voyage form where they must indicate which port they are leaving and which port they are going to. We know that none of the boats can fill in their destination Gaza because Gaza doesn't have a port and it was illegal to travel to Gaza because of the legal sea blockade that Israel had. 
So the port authorities went and checked all the boats, and when they reached the form, they saw that all the boats filled up their destination, Alexandria, Egypt. That was a fraud done on the port authorities. So the port authorities got very mad and impounded all the boats. <laughs> that afternoon, the pro-Palestinians, the organizer of the flotilla, had a press conference in Greece saying that because of this lawfare organization, Shurat Adin from Tel Aviv, who spreads lies against them, they don't have a choice but to cancel the flotilla. <laughs> nations to become an observant state, they were threatening Israel that if they don't reach their goal through negotiation, and if Israel does not agree to their demands around the negotiation table, they're pulling out and they're going to the international institutions. They will go to the UN, they will go to the International Criminal Court, and will get what they want with these institutions. A couple of months ago, they pulled out of the negotiation, they went to the UN Security Council, they asked to become a state, they were refused, so they went to the International Criminal Court. They signed the wrong treaty, and last week, they filed a motion to become members in the court. What they want to do, is to indict Israel for war crimes. They have two allegations against Israel. One, that the IDF is using excessive force in their operations in Gaza and winding up killing civilians, which is a war crime. And the other one is that Israel's policy of building settlements in Judea and Samaria is violation of Section 49 of the Geneva Convention which considered to be a war crime. You can prevent the Palestinians from going to the international courts, from filing these war crime complaints. You can, however, deter them. We realized that once the Palestinians become members in the international courts, the jurisdiction goes both ways. They become plaintiffs, but they become defendants as well. And what the Palestinians did during the Intifada and during the war in the summer and during the pre previous war is a war crime. Shooting thousands of missiles towards civilian areas, sending suicide bombers to kill innocent people is international crime. It's called genocide. So we already filed several complaints in the International Criminal Court against the leaders of the Palestinian Authority, against the commander of the Fatah of the PLO and the Hamas, against Mahmoud Abbas, Khaled Masha, Jibril Rajul, Rami Hamdallah, other officials of the Palestinian Authority, to let them know that if they are going to the International Criminal Court, we will be waiting for them there. The other fault is the Geneva Convention. The Palestinian claims that Israel, by transferring Israelis and encouraging them to live in Judea and Samaria, is violating Section 49 of the Geneva Convention. Section 49 was enacted after World War II, when Germany took over part of Eastern Europe and moved two million people and did a population transfer. And it basically prohibits any population, transfer of population to occupied territories. The Palestinian claim that the West Bank is occupied, and therefore Israel, by moving its population into the West Bank, is violating the Geneva Convention. Israel's position is the territories are not occupied. That Jordan never owned them. 
that after the independence war in Israel, after 48, Jordan annexed the territories, but nobody recognized this annexation, except for two countries, England and Pakistan. And in any event, in 1988, Jordan gave up its right for the territories. So Jordan never had any right on the territories. The Palestinians were not there in 48, they're maybe in 67, and they have no right on these territories. So the, one, the most you can say about these territories is that they are disputed territories. It's basically no one land. You can't say that they are occupied. But we know what your position is regarding these territories. We know what the United States position is. We know that the entire world almost recognizes them as occupied territories. We also know what the position of the international court without even waiting for them to rule on the issue because we all read the up and piece that the chief prosecutor, Mrs. Ben Souda, of the court wrote in the Guardian in the summer telling the Palestinians, now when you became state members, you can come and join the court and file your war crime complaints against Israel and we will be able to rule on them. So we know that if Israel will be fired, if the Palestinians will file worker complaints against Israel regarding this issue, Israel will lose. And that will be a game changer. So what we were thinking is realizing that Israel is not the only country in the world to be blamed for occupying territories. Turkey occupies northern Cyprus. Russia occupies Georgia. Morocco occupies Western Sahara. We went in June last year to the International Court and brought the first complaint against Turkey for occupying northern Cyprus on a 30 long pages brief. We detail exactly what Turkey does in northern Cyprus, how they build universities, they build hospitals, they encourage the population to live there, they give tax incentives to the population. That's exactly what Israel does in the West Bank. We know that the court will not indict Israel, Turkey for war crimes. They may say that it's not for the court to rule on this conflict, it's for the countries to resolve it between each other. And that will set a precedent when the Palestinians will file their complaints against Israel, the court hands will be tied, there will be a precedent saying that the court is not getting involved with occupied territories conflicts. And the last act we took is expanding the war crime complaints against the Palestinians outside of the International Criminal Court, where we, court, where we know the court is biased, but going to different jurisdictions. The first one was in the United States. We filed a war crime complaint in the Attorney General of the United States against the Hamas leaders for shooting missiles towards Ben Gurion Airport during the war. According to American law, no one can threaten American citizens in international court, in international airport. There is such a law. Hamas, by shooting missiles towards Ben Gurion Airport, threatened the life of American citizens who came to visit Israel or were on their way to go back from Israel. That's a war crime. We got 26 American citizens who were in the airport at the time of the alarms, who had to run to the shelters, who risked their life, and they filed a war complaint against the Hamas leaders with a terrorist. <laughs> this is only a portion of the cases we are handling in Israel, United States, Europe, and Canada. Every day we get more and more calls from more and more terror victims who want to fight back, who are seeking justice, who more than anything else in the world don't want to be victims anymore. 
and we are dedicated to help them. We established the Ratadin Israel Law Center to take all these hundreds of cases in an orderly manner and file them in the courts around the world. Non-profit organization, all donations are tax deductible. You have the information in the booklets you are holding. We are dedicated to help the terror victims because we can win the cases. We are doing it because we are winning the cases. I had the privilege to spend two months, the coldest months in my life in New York, <laughs> during the Sokolov trial. That's a lawsuit we filed more than 11 years ago on behalf of 10 families of terror victims that lost their loved ones or got injured themselves in the terror attacks during the first years of the Intifada. We have the Sokolov family sitting here. We have terror attacks like the Hebrew University Cafeteria, suicide bombing in Jaffa Street, in Kindra Street, stabbing. All these acts were done by the Palestinian Authority employees policemen of the Palestinian Authority, security guys, guards of the Palestinian Authority went and carried out this attack or assisted others to carry out these attacks. The Palestinian Authority argument was that these employees were rogue employees. They did what they did in the afternoon hours. They did it without an authorization of the Palestinian Authority. Nobody approved their act. But they found it hard to explain to the jury why the terrorists who committed these attacks, who were arrested by the Israeli forces, who are sentenced and sitting in jail, keeps receiving salaries from the Palestinian Authority on a monthly basis. They found it hard to explain to the jury why they're promoting them in rank and why they give giving compensations to the families of the martyrs of the suicide bombers that committed these attacks. It was no wonder then that when the jury came back after one day, after they heard the trial for 35 days with a judgment of $655 million against the Palestinian Authority in the period. winning the cases. We have judgments for over two billion dollars, but we were able to collect 200 million dollars that went to the hands of the terror victims. We're doing it because we do what governments cannot do. Governments cannot sue other governments. They cannot sue terror organizations. They cannot sue banks. The government's hands are tied. They have political restraints, they have foreign relations they have to take into consideration, they have to be politically correct. We don't. We are private lawyers that represent private victims that have one goal, to bankrupt terrorism, one loss at a time. And we'll continue fighting terrorism in court because we don't have any other choice. We live in Israel. We want to send our kids to school and make sure they're coming back safe. We want to ride our buses. We want to shop in our cafes. We want to go to our malls. We want to live safely in our country. And yes, this is our country. This is our country. way before the Balfour Declaration, or the Peace Commission, or the Partition Plan. It's our land because of the very first word in the Bible, Bereshit bara Elohim. God gave it to us, God gave us the right to live in this country. The Jewish land belongs to the Jewish people, and we will do anything it takes 
to keep living here safely. We are sick and tired going with parents to the Abu Kabir Forensic Center and helping them identify the children's bodies with dental records. We are sick and tired watching parents in funerals saying Kaddish on their children. And even worse, watching children saying Kaddish on their parents. But mostly we are sick and tired sitting in the military courts watching the defendant from the Hamas who are looking at the judge eyes, smiling at him and promising him that they will win. They will not win. We will win. Because we are fighting for our national survival. Don't stand idly by our brother's blood. We will not stand idly by our brother's blood. We cannot afford it. The state of Israel cannot afford it. The Western world cannot afford it. You cannot afford it. Thank you very much.